We're going to be talking a little bit about, about the Trinity, and this certainly isn't the, uh, the shallow end of the pool. Any you guys like swimming? I know some of you guys just came from swimming, right? Um, so this jumping into the deep end, but uh, we're going to answer the question, how can, we, how can we explain, biblically speaking, the Trinity? Uh, before we jump into that, there's this, uh, there's this glass bridge over in China, which just those two words don't seem like they, they go together, right? Glass and bridge. But it's a glass bridge over a deep gorge in China, and it's not just glass. It's actually also a screen, and so, uh, and so they can actually mess with unaware bridge pedestrians. Maybe you guys, maybe you guys have seen some, some videos. I'm going to show you just one just real quickly here. So, so they can they can make it look like it's all cracking and shattering and and uh, and, and obviously scare people. Um, there's apparently a lot of people, understandably, in China who are now afraid to go out on that bridge, right? Which which is which is which is understandable. But as we come to the topic of the Trinity, some Christians get scared because it's it's difficult to understand, right? It's difficult to explain, and because of that, we'd rather not go out on the ledge. Of the Trinity and, and even sometimes speak about it. On top of that, skeptics have tried to shatter and splinter Christianity really by attacking this doctrine of the Trinity. And so it's my hope when we're finished tonight, each of us will grow in our delight of our triune God and our faith will be strengthened or fortified. We need to understand the Trinity as best as we can with what God has revealed to us through His Word. One author put it this way, and I, I really like this. He said, to know the Trinity is to know God, an eternal and personal God of infinite beauty, interest, and fascination. The Trinity is a God we can know and forever grow to know better. So I hope that that's your desire tonight, right? Is to grow to know God better and to continue down that path of growing to know Him better each and every day. And so I want to start tonight with some opening observations that, that will kind of lay a foundation and we'll build our study off of tonight. First observation I want to tell you, show you guys is that the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. Did you guys know that? The word is actually not found anywhere in Scripture, but the truth of the Trinity is found throughout Scripture. Uh, the word Trinity actually comes from the Latin version of the Bible. Um, it's, a, it's a Latin word, and literally it means tri-unity. Um, if you want to kind of break that out a little bit, it means three in oneness. And obviously we're going to talk a little bit deeper tonight about what that means. But it's not found the word itself in the Bible, but the truth is. Secondly, we'll be diving into the field of systematic theology. Um, of course, Griffin's not here tonight. He's actually over in Georgia helping build a building at a camp, I guess. But, um, but he loves systematic theology. Uh, he, I think he got a systematic theology book for, for Christmas. But, but simply put, for those of you who, who aren't big fans of systematic theology because you don't really know what it is, um, it, it, it's the, the way by which we answer questions. Basically, and it's really one question, what does the Bible say about a given topic? And so it involves searching the scriptures to find all the verses that pertain to a specific topic and then put them together so we know what God says. And so systematic means to, to carefully organize by topic. Some of you I know are organizers, right? You like to organize. So that's what theologians, people who study God, they study these topics and then they, they organize what the Bible has to say about it so that they can form the doctrine. Um, for example, many books of the Bible give information about angels, right? And so we're going to be looking actually later this month at, uh, at angels and, and demons and spiritual beings and what the Bible has to say about them. Um, but because no one book gives all the information about angels, systematic theology studies the entire Bible and organizes the truth into what is called angelology, right? That is one category that we would, we would call angelology is the study of, of angels or spiritual beings. And so we'll be doing this Today, we'll be systematically looking at the doctrine of the Trinity. Does that make sense? Hopefully, I didn't lose anybody yet because we're, 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 we're going deeper, all right? So, so we're going to be in the field of systematic theology. Thirdly, this topic will stretch our minds. But I want to let you know, right, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing to be stretched. Jesus summarized the first commandment in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your what? Mind, right? With all your mind. And so someone has, has said that the doctrine of the Trinity is the most important Christian doctrine that most people never think about. A.W. Tozer 
one of my favorite authors, often said, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And so we need to think about this. We need to try to wrap our mind around it as much as we possibly can, even if it stretches us. Fourthly, the Trinity is one of the truly unique doctrines of Christianity. Actually, I want to let you know that this is a crucial doctrine because it concerns who God is, what God is like, how he works, and how he is to be approached. And so the personal fellowship between the three different persons within the Trinity is really the thread that runs through the entire Bible. It's really at the center, really at the middle of what we believe, and it shapes all of our other doctrines and beliefs. And so it's important, and you really don't see anything like it uh, in other faith systems. And fifthly, uh, I know you might be disappointed with this, but the lesson tonight is not going to answer all your questions. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mac. But it, it's just not going to answer all your questions. But I hope it will grow your awe in our awesome God, as, as maybe you, you find some, some answers to some of the questions uh, that we have. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Merchant, who's actually a theology professor at Moody Bible Institute, my, uh, my alma mater, gave this explanation of the Trinity. Here's, here's how he begins. He said, some consider the doctrine of the Trinity to be an impenetrable paradox, meaning we can't really understand it, right? And this results from, from theological nitpicking, uh, a, a technical uh, addendum to our shared faith with, practical, with little practical significance for the Christian life. Meaning he's saying this... A lot of people see that we can understand it. It doesn't really add a whole lot to our faith, and so it's not really worth going in into depth. But he says, on the contrary, the Trinity is the central mystery of Christianity, disclosing edifying truths about God's nature and revealing the deep logic of the gospel. And so I agree, guys. And despite the fact that it's complicated, right, we must do our best to understand it as fully as we possibly can. And so, with those opening observations, let me give you guys our outline for tonight, all right? Who likes, anybody like outlines? I, I like outlines. I'm not organized by nature, so I need to organize my thoughts. And so, here's where we're going. We're going to look at exposition. I mean, we're going to, that, that question we're going to ask there is, what does the Bible say about the Trinity? And so, our approach will be to allow the scriptures to speak to us as we see how the doctrine of the Trinity progressively unfolds. Then we're going to move to explanation. How can we describe the Trinity? How can, we, how can we explain it? What's the best ways to explain the Trinity, giving attention to some of the early creeds of Christianity? Then we'll look at illustrations. You guys have heard some illustrations about the Trinity. There's a bunch of them out there. We're going to look at some of them. We'll consider some of these common uh, metaphors. And, and ultimately, we're going to see why they all fall short, right? Why they're inadequate. And finally, we're going to finish with where we often do application. How does this doctrine of the Trinity really affect us today, tomorrow, right, when we wake up and go about our day. As we delight in the Trinity, we'll discover, I think, a number of ways that it really practically applies to us. And so as we jump into the exposition part, guys, let me, let me read to you what Wayne Grudem in his Systematic Theology book wrote. He said, the doctrine of the Trinity is one of the most important doctrines of the Christian faith. To study the Bible's teachings on the Trinity gives us great insight into the question that is at the center of all our seeking after God, and that question is, what is God like in himself? And we learn here that in himself, in his very being, God exists in the persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yet there is one God. And so we're going to look first at the Old Testament. And although the Old Testament doesn't specifically openly explain the Trinity, there are several passages that point to the plurality, meaning that there's more than, than, than one person of the Godhead, right? If you go all the way back to the first chapter of the Bible, for example, Genesis 126, it says, Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so you don't have to go far in the Bible to find the fact that there was a plurality there, right? There was, there was more than one person involved in creation. Uh, a couple chapters later, Genesis 3.22, it says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. And then in Genesis 11.7, God said, Come, let us go down there and confuse their language. This is at the Tower of Babel, so that they may not understand one another's speech. And then a little bit later in the Old Testament, Isaiah 6.8, uh, Isaiah said, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I... The I here is singular, right? God, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Which us, is it singular or plural? All you English fans. It's plural, right? Plural. And so we see here that, that 
in the Old Testament, uh, there's a beginning of the teaching of God in three persons, right? But then when we get to the New Testament, there's more clear evidence for the Trinity with the coming of Jesus and the sending of the Holy Spirit. And so let me give you guys some of the key passages where all three persons of the Trinity are named together. Uh, for example, Matthew 3, 16 and 17. At the baptism of Jesus, it says, And when Jesus was baptized, who we see so far, right? Jesus. Immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God, right? Here we see the second person of the Godhead. Descending like a dove, and coming to rest on him, and behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Who's speaking there? God the Father, right? And so here in, in, in one moment we see God... The Father speaking, God the Son in his incarnated body being baptized, and God the Holy Spirit descending as a dove. And so we, we, we have at this precise moment all three members of the Trinity performing, notice, three completely different activities, right? God the Father is speaking from heaven, God the Son is being baptized, and, and, then, and then spoken to, to from heaven by God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit is descending from heaven to rest upon and empower Jesus for ministry. It's a beautiful picture of the Trinity. Uh, a little bit later, Matthew, Matthew 28, 19, uh, some of you memorize this in, in Awana or, or otherwise, the Great Commission, right? Um, Jesus charges his followers to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of what? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so our, our task of evangelism that Jesus gave us is distinctively Trinitarian, right? The baptism is done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, over in the epistles in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul said this, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And so here in one sentence, in one verse, he's brought in all three persons of the Trinity. And Peter did it as well. 1 Peter 1, 2, Peter said, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. And so it's very clear that these apostles, Peter and, and Paul, and, and, and understood th this concept of, of God being three in one. And then over in Jude, verses 20 through 21, it says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Again, we have all three persons here mentioned in the same verse. And so I, wanna, I want us to consider three statements which I think summarize what the Bible teaches about God, right? You guys ready? Firstly, there is one God. How many gods, guys? One God, right? The Bible is very clear that there is one and only God. He is the only one being. There is no three gods, right? Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, this is, you know, this is where God is really explaining to his people who he is. And he says, the Lord is one. Isaiah 45, 5 through 6, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, th though you do, do not know me, that people may know from their rising of the sun from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no other, right? Very clear. Romans 3, 29, 30, Paul over in the New Testament. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one. And then finally, James, James 2.19, you believe that God is one, James says, you do well. And so firstly, guys, we need to understand there is one God. Secondly, we're going we're gonna to complicate it a little bit. God is in three persons. This means, and we'll, we'll, we'll dig into this a little bit more later, but this means the Father is not the Son and not the Holy Spirit, Right? The Son is not the Father and not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father and not the Son. God is one in essence, three in person. And so listen to these three verses from the Gospel of John where Jesus references actually all three members of the Godhead. John 14, verses 16 to 17, Jesus says, And I, Jesus speaking, will ask the Father and he will give you the Helper, another Helper, speaking of the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and, and will be in you. So all, Jesus mentions all three members here. Uh, just a few verses later, John 14, 26, Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, 
He will teach you all things and bring, bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And then one chapter later, John 15, 26, Jesus says, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And so we see there is one God here who exists in three persons. But thirdly, I want you to see each person is fully God, right? One God in three persons, each person is fully God. One isn't the other, and each member of the Trinity is equal in rank, equal in power, glory, and majesty. And there are a multitude of verses establishing the Father, Son, and Spirit as, as distinct, meaning different, and as divine each. But for the sake of time, we'll just look at uh, one for each, all right? Firstly, the Father is God. Malachi 2.10 says, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? And there are, again, many, many other verses about God the Father being fully God. Uh, the Son is God. If you remember after Thomas, we often call him Doubting Thomas because he expressed his, his doubts about the resurrection of Jesus, right? After he expressed his doubts, he boldly declared when Jesus appeared to him, his, de his deity, he, he, he proclaimed the deity of Christ in John 20, 28. He, he fell down and said, my Lord and my God. And we see that Jesus throughout the Gospels declares his own deity. And then finally, guys, thirdly, the Holy Spirit is God. In Acts 5, verses 3 and 4, Peter asks Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to man, but to God. And so is, is, is God the Father fully God? Yes or no? Is God the Son fully God? Is God the Holy Spirit fully God? Amen. There is one God in three persons, and each person is fully God. And so we've seen this, this exposition, right? We've looked at a lot of verses. I know I've kind of gone through them pretty quickly. But what the Bible has to say about Trinity is this, these three points. One God who exists in three persons, and each is fully God, and each fulfills a different role. And so now let's look at the explanation. How do we, how do we describe the Trinity? Because as we've seen, this comes directly from the pages of Scripture, right? And I believe that, that as we read it, we see that these biblical authors were captivated by who God is, by his triunity. Uh, my former pastor, Ray Pritchard, uh, just, a, just a great man of God, he, he described the Trinity this way. He said, we find evidence for oneness, evidence for threeness, and evidence for three in oneness. And so by carefully pulling all the evidence together... And without citing any part of the evidence in favor of other evidence, we arrive at the doctrine of the Trinity, right? He's saying we pull everything we see in the Bible together and we come to this orthodox doctrine, meaning it's, it's, it's not new. This is what we see that Jesus himself believed, the apostles believed, the early church believed, and, and every true Bible preaching Jesus uh, worshiping person has believed. And so he's absolutely correct. As we've seen the last, last couple of weeks in this series, the foundation of our understanding on any doctrine, including the doctrine of the Trinity, must come from where? From God's Word, right? From Scripture. To say it another way, the doctrine must be divinely revealed through God's Word, not humanly constructed. You want to know what, what's the one unifying theme in every cult that's out there? From Mormons to Jehovah Witness to the even crazier ones? is that it's someone, a human, has had something revealed to them from outside of Scripture, right? It's humanly constructed. One pastor said it this way, it's so absurd from a human standpoint that no one would have invented it, speaking of the Trinity. Try to explain it and you'll lose your mind, but try to, to, to deny it and you'll lose your soul. And, and, and so listen, we, we need to try to understand it as much as God allows us to. In his word. Here, let me give you guys the doctrine of the Trinity as it's written in our own church, CBC's Statement of Faith. It's actually, if you look on our page, the Statement of Faith, it's the very first bullet point after the initial statement on the inspiration and authority of Scripture, which I read, um, I think, two weeks ago, right? It says this, there is one true God eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each of whom equally possesses all the attributes of deity and the characteristics of personality. So that's what our church really believes and stands on. And, and you, you can't really move to the next bullet points in your statement of faith until you believe this one, right? 
But it's been difficult for people to explain the Trinity over the years. And so various heresies, you guys know what a heresy is? False teachings, right? Various false teachings have surfaced in the history of the church. Some of which are, are actually uh, not new. They came early on in the church and still hang around today. And so let me, let's just take a look quickly at four of these, of these heresies. I think if we can understand a little bit of what the Trinity really isn't, um, it'll help us not only to discern error, but it'll help us really to understand what it is. Um, first one is modalism. Uh, and this teaches that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are different names for the same God acting in different roles or modes, right? So we get the name modalism. Modern day modalists would be the United Apostolic Church, the one is Pentecostals. Um, they, they, they deny the fact that it's, it's three persons, right? That's really the part that they take objection to. It's, it's one God who's just kind of doing different roles, right? Like someone who's a, um, a manager, but they also do, you know, two other roles within their job. So, so that's, that's a false teaching. Um, second one is monarchianism. And this teaches that God is only one person and that Jesus and the Holy Spirit exist as impersonal attributes. Um, so they're just kind of attributes of God. And this is what the Unitarians believe. They really just, they believe in, in just the one God. Um, the third one, which is probably the most common one, is Arianism. And this is named after a popular heretic named Arius. And, and it really focuses in on Jesus Christ, which he is the one who people usually attack, right? And it denies the full deity of Jesus. Arius taught that there was a time when the son, Jesus, didn't exist. That he's not God. This is ultimately what Jehovah's Witnesses believe and Muslims believe. Muslims will tell you if you have a conversation with them, yes, I believe in Jesus. Say, oh, well, what do you believe about Jesus? And they'll say, well, he's a prophet and, you know, he did good things. But they, 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 they will not say, will not believe that he is God. Same with Jehovah's Witnesses. And then the final one is tritheism. Um, and this is uh, not quite as common, but it's, it's the belief that there are actually three separate gods, right? That God the Father is completely separate from God the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is what Mormons, uh, for the most part, believe. Uh, and, and so in order to correct these errors uh, that rose up early in the church, we even see Paul trying to correct some of these errors in his, in his epistles that, that are contained in our New Testament. But the early church developed concise creedal statements. You guys know what a creed is? A creed is simply uh, comes from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. And so the church wanted to make these creeds so people could memorize them and, and state them. And, and, and they were important because in an age when people didn't have their own Bibles, right, they didn't have a printed copy of God's word in their hands, much less oftentimes in their houses, um, they needed to memorize these things so they knew what the Bible actually said. And so these statements of belief summarized biblical doctrines while fighting heresy. And so I, I want you just to read along with me. They're, they're going to come up on the screen here, I think, in just a moment. As I'm going to um, look at three, what three of these creeds say about the Trinity. The first one is going to be the Apostles' Creed. And, and uh, really it affirms a belief in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Apostles' Creed says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, right? And so even right here in the Apostles' Creed, we, we have this Trinitarian view of who God is. Um, it's, it's short and concise, though, which that was kind of the point of the Apostles' Creed. Secondly is the Nicene Creed. Um, in order to kind of put in a little more detail, the Nicene Creed was developed in 325 A.D., uh, it took its final form about 60, 55 years later in AD 381. Um, but, but notice how it's developed a little bit more here, the doctrine of the Trinity. The Nicene Creed says, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence of the Father, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and Son, and with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified. And so you see how there's a little bit more development here from the, from the Apostles' Creed uh, about what the Trinity really is. And, and listen, people memorized this and, and said it almost daily uh, for, for centuries. There's even churches today that continue in the, in the tradition of saying the creeds. Now anything that's just kind of mindlessly said can lose its, its value, right? I think we understand that. That's why Jesus even gave a warning about the Lord's Prayer. It's an example, we're, but we're not just to kind of mindlessly recite it. Um, and so there's, you know, there's, we don't want to just kind of mindlessly recite the creeds either, but it's important to know them, to, to read them. There's, there's many uh, 
really good Orthodox creeds. Uh, the third one I want to read to you today is the Athanasian Creed, which, uh, again, builds even a little bit more off of the, the Nicene Creed. And it's from the 5th century, and it's really the, the, the strongest and longest of the three. And I'll just quote some of it, uh, but if you guys have time, I would encourage you, uh, look up the Athanasian Creed and, and, and read through it. There's, there's so much good truth and doctrine in it. Um, but it says this, that we worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity. I love that. Neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence. For the person of the Father is a distinct person. The person of the Son is another. And that of the Holy Spirit is still another. But the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one. Their glory equal. Their majesty co-eternal. What quality the Father has, the Son has. And the Holy Spirit has. And yet there are not three eternal beings. There is but one eternal being. So too there are not three uncreated or immeasurable beings. There is but one uncreated and immeasurable being. We must worship their trinity and their unity and their unity in their trinity. Anyone then who desires to be saved should think thus about the trinity. Does that make sense to you guys? I think that I, I love this, this, this creed. It really kind of lays it out kind of flat for us to, to really try to be able to understand it and wrap our head around it. That, that, that they're... They're distinct, yet one, and equal in, in attributes. And so let me give you guys, as we move to our, our third part here, some illustrations that uh, hopefully can maybe help us to understand the Trinity. These have, there's been many that have been proposed over, over the centuries. A number of metaphors and analogies have been used. I would say that there are probably strengths and weaknesses in each one of them uh, with some, uh, you know, comes a little bit of help in understanding the Trinity, Trinity at a basic level. But we also need to be careful um, because many of them are kind of like a shattered glass floor, right? They just, they, they just really don't fully hold up to what the Bible says about who God is. And so let me give you ten different analogies that are commonly made about the Trinity. Uh, but before I list them, I want you to keep Romans 11.33 in mind. I, I, I quoted this when I prayed uh, earlier. But Paul writes, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. What Paul's saying is basically, and, and there's authors throughout the Bible who said the same thing, we can't fully grasp who God is, right? God's knowable. He reveals himself to us, but he's so much greater than we are that we can't, as, as finite beings who are, you know, stuck in, the space-time continuum at one place at one time. We can't understand an eternal God, whoever has been, is, and ever will be, and who exists in three persons. Um, but we try. And so let me give you guys these, uh, these illustrations. The first one, maybe you've heard some of these, is a three-leaf clover, right? A clover has three different leaves, and yet it's just one clover. Any of you guys look for four-leaf clovers? They're heretical. Don't find them. No, I'm just kidding. But it's a three-leaf clover, right? It's, it's it, it, again... It kind of works, but it it's, it's falls short. A tree. A tree is made up of roots, trunk, and branches, but it's just one tree. Uh, what about water? Water exists in three states, right? Liquid, ice, vapor, but uh, even in all three of its states, it's, it's still water. Uh, some people have said statues. Uh, you think of, of uh, three identical statues emerging from a single a pool or liquid of matter like gold, for example. Um, they're still this, the same uh, material, but they're three distinct statues. I think it falls a little short. The sun, I've heard this one before, and this one's a little more confusing to me. It's, they say, you know, the father is the sun, which is already confusing. Um, sun, S-U-N. Uh, the sun is the light coming from the sun, and the Holy Spirit is the heat coming from the sun. Um, it's an illustration, but uh, it, it falls a little short. Uh, I've heard people use a person with different roles. Uh, for example, I'm one person, but I am a husband, I'm a father, I'm also a pastor, right? So I have, I have three different roles, but that falls short because I'm still, uh, still only one person. Um, a hole, uh, I've actually heard Pastor Carl use this one before. If you look at a, a hole, it has three dimensions. It has length, width, and depth. But it's, you know, it's ultimately just, just one whole. Uh, this is really actually true for you, you, know, you geometry fans. This is true of any three-dimensional figure, right? They, any three-dimensional form has length, width, and depth. Um, yeah, it's, 
it, it helps to a point. Um, a person, I, I've heard this one before, a person all has different dimensions as well. We're made up of intellect, emotions, and the will. Uh, so God is one person with three parts. Um, an egg, <laughs> an egg has, has kind of has three parts, right? The, the white, the yolk, and the shell. Um, but it's still just one egg. Uh, and finally, let me give you this one, a musical chord. I'm not smart enough to really understand this one, but if you're into music theory, uh, maybe you can get it. Uh, let's just say, for example, uh, the key of C major. It's the first, third, and fifth notes, and they have distinct sounds, yet they make up one sound as they all blend together. Um, so that's, that's been proposed before as well. Again, some of the, some of the elements of these illustrations um, on a human level, I think, can maybe help us to, to, to try to understand a little bit of what the, the Trinity is like. They can, you know, be insightful, but many of them, even if you really look at them and break them down, they lean towards Arianism, right? Or maybe modalism or partialism. Actually, I think the best illustration is, is really ultimately found in the Bible, and it's, it's the incarnation of Jesus. You know what the incarnation of Jesus is? It just literally means in flesh, <laughs> when Jesus took on flesh, right? John 14, 9, Jesus declares, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And then in Colossians 1, 15, we, we read that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And then later in Hebrews 1, 3, we see he is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact image imprint of his nature and so we, we we see just in jesus taking on human flesh and being one with the father that, that they're one but they're different persons right the following illustration here that uh that you see can you guys see that i think it's big enough right yeah all right this kind of helps as well it shows how god is one in essence existing as three di different persons in contrast on the right to the era, era of modalism, right? The one on the left is what, is what we believe from the Bible. We see the Father, the Son, and then the Holy Spirit are all God in the middle there. But then you see the link between each other. They are not, you know, the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. But the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Where you see is modalism um, is, is different. And you see that, that little word that you kind of see between God and these three persons is sometimes, Right? It teaches that the Holy Spirit is sometimes God, the Father is sometimes God, the Son is sometimes God. But that's, that's different than what the Bible ultimately teaches and, and, and ultimately really is, is false teaching. And so let's, let's move on. You guys, does this make sense to you guys? Just nod if you're still with me. I haven't, I haven't lost you. I, did, I didn't warn you. We're going in the deep end, right? But it's good. It's good to be stretched. Um, and so instead of seeing the doctrine of the Trinity as, as just kind of, sticking out from from the side of christianity only to be able to be understood by old theologians i want to i want to focus on how this really applies to our lives and so i want to move into kind of our last section here of our outline and the application what is what does the trinity really mean to me on a, on a daily basis firstly i think and, and this is important and i've come to learn this and so i hope you guys will as well the trinity teaches us to treasure who god is if you're if you're feeling spiritually apathetic you know kind of indifferent right that, that you're not growing i think it's time to to try to climb up to, to to these heights of the nature of god and so as we look to the bible to help us to understand the trinity we're both learning about god which is really glorifying god right when we try to understand him on a deeper level it's glorifying to him on the other hand to be wrong about god is to be wrong about really our, our eternal destiny and so we we, we want to be right John Calvin once wrote that if we try to think about God without thinking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then we're only the, then only the barren, empty name of God fits uh, about in our brains to the exclusion of the true God. And so, you know, we're, we need to try to understand God, all of who he is, right? And that includes all three persons. And I think as you try to do that, you glorify him and you start to, to really love him and treasure him on a deeper level. Secondly, the Trinity puts us in our proper place. Um, when you really try to understand this, you understand how much you don't understand. Does that make sense to anybody? I know that, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, we understand as much as God allows us to. God didn't create the world um, because he was lonely, right? 
God, God has always existed as Trinity, and, and, and love has eternally flowed between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He made me, he made you, not because he needs us, right? He created you because he loves you. He didn't do it because he, he, he lacks something, but rather he was so filled with joy that his delight overflowed into his creation, into each one of us. And so we, we, we need to understand that and understand that, that we obviously are not God and, and he is. And, and it should be our, our life's goal to understand God to the best of our ability, but ultimately that, that, that he is, as many biblical authors came to find out, including David and, and Paul and others, that, that he's unsearchable, right? We, we can't fully understand him, but the more that we try to, the, the, the deeper we, we fall into our relationship and our love with him. Charles Spurgeon, I think, explained the importance of the Trinity well, the the early 20th century British pastor, he said, no subject of, of thought will, will tend more to humble the mind than thoughts of God. But while the subject humbles the mind, it also expands the mind. The most excellent study for expanding the soul is the science of Christ and Him crucified and the knowledge of the Godhead, the glorious Trinity. You can tell Spurgeon's putting a lot of thought into who God is, right? Into Jesus and Jesus crucified and, and, and how... God exists in three persons. And so thirdly, guys, I want you to see that the Trinity also gives us a model for unity within our Christian community. To describe the work of the Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, we see this term being used amongst theologians. It's the, the term perichoresis, which literally means kind of dancing around. And each member of the Trinity is in kind of a divine dance interacting with one another. Expressing love for one another and complementing the work each has to do. God is in relationship in a way that, that we are not in relationship. God, uh, God is in relationship in a way ultimately that, that we were intended to be in relationship. That we are invited to be in relationship. So just as there has always been harmony within the Godhead, so too we are called to be in harmony with every other believer. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what Jesus prayed the night before he died for his for his disciples, his followers, those present and those that would come over the centuries later, including us. Listen to John 17, 20 through 23. Jesus said, I do not ask for these only, meaning his disciples, but also those who will believe in me through their word. Hopefully that's each and every one of us here tonight. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me. And that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you love me. I mean, amazing thing for Jesus to pray, right? He's praying for us as believers to be unified, to be one. And the example he wants us to follow is how God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are unified. And so our oneness as believers is somehow grounded in the oneness between Father and Son and Holy Spirit. The way that they relate to each other, the way that they demonstrate love for one another and work in concert together to accomplish the purpose of God in the world. We need to try to be the same, right? That's what the world should see as Jesus prayed that we are one. Fourthly, the truth of the Trinity helps us understand other Christian doctrines. I obviously don't have time tonight to delve into the, the depths of this, but, but doctrines like important ones like the incarnation, the crucifixion of Christ, propitiation, substitutionary atonement, the resurrection, the ascension and the second coming, all of these only make sense within the truth of the Trinity. Remember, salvation comes to us from the Father, through the Son, by the means of the Holy Spirit. And so once we, 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 really, we really seek out the truth of, of, of the Trinity and we, and we place our faith in it, all these other doctrines really open up to us. Does that make sense? All right. Fifthly, understanding this doctrine helps you to spot error. I talked about that briefly earlier, but a true knowledge of the Trinity will help you to discern false doctrine. And guys, listen, there are many of them out there today. I've been sitting in, in, in churches and conferences in front of 
computer and TV screens watching and listening to sermons or on the radio. And I was just, many times I've just, sh- I shake my head and say, that's not true. That's not right. <laughs> that's not what the Bible says. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, Paul said to Timothy, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears or tickling ears, depending on your, on your translation, they will accumulate for themselves, for, the, for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Uh, people have done that in, in every generation, but they're doing it, I believe, in increasing numbers in our generation. So once you understand this and you search the scriptures to really find out what it says about the Trinity, it helps you to understand when people are talking about a different kind of Trinity, right? Um, number six, treasuring the Trinity accelerates evangelism. I mean, when you're, when you're witnessing, when you're having spiritual conversations, which we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, remember, you're an ambassador. You're a representative, right? Some of you guys come from military families. You know what an ambassador is. You're, you're a representative of the triune God. Listen to how the entire Trinity is involved in this, in, in, in evangelism. In John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22, it said, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Listen, whenever we, we try to do anything for God, we need to do it on the standpoint of the triune God who created, redeemed, and enabled us to do so in the first place. Listen, one pastor said it this way, preaching a generic God to hopeless sinners is worthless. The world needs to hear about a triumphant, sovereign, sinner-saving, devil-defeating, sin-conquering, death-destroying, all-powerful, all-present, all-knowing, righteous, loving, wrathful, triune God. That's who God is, right? And, And that's what the Bible teaches us about him, and so that's who we should be preaching and teaching and sharing with others. Seventh, grasping the Trinity is a motivation for baptism. Remember, I read the Great Commission a little bit ago. Jesus commissioned us to go and make disciples of our neighbors and of all the nations, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. When when a believer is immersed in the water and baptized in the name of the Trinity, he or she is recognizing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are with them. And since the totality, since the entire Trinity is actively engaged in in baptism, how can we not follow God and obey God in in, in baptism if we're saved? One of the greatest things I think about our church is you don't have to wait for a special baptism service. That's how it was in pretty much all the churches I grew up in. They were were relatively small. We didn't have our own baptismal, so we kind of had to save up the baptisms and do them like once a year, right? No, you can be baptized almost any Sunday here at CBC. And so if you, if you haven't followed God in obedience, and it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't play any role in your salvation, right? But it, it, it declares that, that you believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that Jesus died for your sins. And it pictures that, the death, burial, and the res- resurrection of Christ. It's a beautiful public declaration. I know some Christians who really haven't moved forward in their, in their faith and in their relationship with Christ because they have not obeyed in baptism and finally guys number eight a proper view of the trinity teaches us how to pray Uh, another common question that i hear and we may we may answer this a little bit later in our series but uh how do i pray Or, or or do i pray in the name of jesus in the name of god do i pray to god do i pray to jesus there's lots of questions about prayer but in general the pattern found in the bible is to pray to Father, to our Father God, in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? That's, 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 that's the pattern that's given to us. God the Father hears us because of what God the Son has accomplished and, and, and through the work of the Holy Spirit who's in us. And so when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, he opened his prayer. You guys remember in Matthew 6, 9, our Father who is what? Our Father who is in heaven, Right? Having said that, it's not wrong to pray to Jesus. Stephen did it in Acts chapter 7. uh, As he was being stoned, it said, and and as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Listen, all three members of the Trinity are God, right? We've established that. And and, and so you, you can rightly worship each and every one of them. As a matter of fact, I would say worship is due to each and every one of them. But the pattern that's given in the Bible is we pray 
to God the Father in the name of God the Son. So I know, I know we've covered a lot of ground tonight, right? Anybody, anybody more confused than they were originally? Don't, don't raise your hand, hopefully. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing I want you to take away tonight. The foundation of the Trinity in Scripture is rock solid. It really is. It will never shatter. It will never splinter. God has given us what he wants us to know. The Trinity is not just some kind of uh, added on little doctrine to, to what we find in the Bible, right? It's not precariously hanging from a bridge, uh, uh, you know, like, like, like something that doesn't belong. No, the Trinity is the foundation of the gospel, and without the Trinity, there is no gospel. And so there's so much more to know about God's glorious being and, and his triune nature. And so I want to encourage you to press on, keep seeking to know God better today than you did yesterday and, and to know him more tomorrow than you did today. And so as we sang earlier in worship, we need to proclaim the wonder. We need to proclaim the mystery, right? There's wonder and there's mystery in this. That God in three persons, blessed Trinity. And so for me, guys, I say, I say this. I say glory to the Father who so loved the world that he gave his only Son. And glory to the Son who loved us and gave himself up for us. And glory to the Spirit who is God's love that has been poured into our hearts. Glory to the God, the three in one. Amen? Amen? Amen. And so I pray for you all as the Apostle Paul did for the believers in the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That's it, right? We're here because of the grace of Jesus, what he's done for us that we don't deserve. We're here because of the love of God who made a way by sending Jesus in the first place. And we're here because the Holy Spirit who is in us and who guides us and who helps us and who convicts us and who imparts truth to us, right? That's it. It's, it's, it's three gods, three, one God and three persons. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for these deep truths from your word. God, I pray that as we seek to understand you, that you would uh, reveal yourself to us through your word, uh, that it would be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. God, we thank you that uh, you, you, you are knowable. Even though we can't know that the depths of, of who you are, God, we can understand what you want to reveal to us. And you desire for us to know you and to be in a, in a close relationship with you. And so, God, I pray that as we seek you out, as we search the pages of scriptures to understand more about you, God, that, that you would reveal yourself to us, that we would understand each and every day a little bit more about you, uh, that we would open up our, our hearts, our, our, our minds, our lives to what you want to show us and to what you want us to do. And God, that we would walk the path that you have preordained for us. And we thank you, God, for the work of the Father who so loved each and every one of us. We thank you for the work of the Son who lived a perfect life and died paying for our sins in our place, taking the punishment that we deserve and offering us each new life, forgiveness and freedom freely because of what he's accomplished for us. And we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit who indwells us, that our bodies are his temple. And God, that he is there as our, as our helper, as our, as our guide, as the one who convicts us of sin, as the one who helps us to understand the truths on the pages of Scripture. So God, we thank you that you are three in one. Help us to understand that. Help us to stand on that truth. Help us, God, to build all the other truths of Scripture out of who you are. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Uh, there are, I think, or will be uh, family discussion questions available again on uh, the website, usually at communitybiblechurch.us slash info. Uh, hopefully, if you want to talk through some of this with your family, that's, that's helpful to you. Hopefully, at some point in the next weeks. I don't, even, I don't even know if it's to say weeks, months. But hopefully, we'll be back to small groups at some point. Um, in the not too distant future, I, I know uh, you, you guys like small groups, right? I love I love small groups as well. So I know uh, 
it's a time where we can encourage each other and talk through some of this stuff and pray for each other. And it's really an important part of what we do. I've always said, uh, so some of you have probably heard this, but in my life, I've often learned more in a circle than I have in a row or in a pew, right? Um, so it's important, and we, we will get back to this, but it is an opportunity in the meantime uh, to kind of circle up as a family, right? And, and God's given us that opportunity to spend a little bit more time for some of us with our families. And uh, so there's an opportunity to encourage each other within our homes spiritually and have some of these kinds of conversations that we do in small groups. Um, one uh, little announcement, I mentioned this last week, but keep in mind, uh, we are uh, sponsoring and, and helping to host uh, the FCA Fields of Faith, which is going to be at the drive-in uh, at the end of this month, uh, October 28th, Wednesday night. Uh, I was just there Wednesday, kind of s- helping scope things out, what that's going to look like. And uh, so it's going to be different than we usually do it at some one of the local high school stadiums. Um, this is going to be a little bit different with social distancing in cars. Uh, but uh, but uh, there's going to be a worship band. There's going to be testimonies. Uh, Virgil, uh, who's from our church and who is going to be, who's part-time with FCA, Lord willing, be full-time soon, is going to be sharing the gospel. So it's a really neat opportunity to bring, if you have an unsaved friend, maybe they won't come to church with you, but maybe they'll come to the drive-in with you, right, and hear the gospel. So uh, I'll have a slide for that maybe next week. I'm still waiting on some graphics from FCA, but uh, um, just uh, think and pray about it. Think about who, if you can maybe go and who, if you can, who God may want you to bring. You don't have to be an athlete. You know, obviously, um, but uh, <laughs> if <laughs> anybody, it's open to anybody. Um, but uh, yeah, obviously, if you are an athlete at one of the schools, you'll hear a little bit more about it, probably. Um, thanks again for coming, guys. I appreciate you all. Uh, we're going to be continuing uh, through some of these common questions. We're going to ask them. We're going to answer them biblically. Uh, has, has any of this been a help to you guys so far? Yeah. All right. Good. Uh, Important stuff, and, and I, know, I know you guys, some of you have been learning about this for your whole lives, but um, for me, it's, again, I, sometimes the more I understand, the more I understand I don't understand, and I go back to God's Word, and that's the place that we go to find, find the answers, and so I hope maybe tonight something more about who God is and the way He exists in three persons was, uh, was revealed to you. So thanks again. Appreciate you all. Have a great night. See you back next week. And uh, God bless, right? Thank you, everybody who is streaming online. Appreciate you all. Welcome uh, to come back in person or live stream next week as well.